canals were the next big thing. And the Erie Canal is like the mother of all canals. Um, by the early 20s, water transportation um, was moving towards steamboats. Uh, we had flatboats, barges, and canals. I mean, there's some natural rivers that lend themselves to acting like canals. Um, but we're starting to mechanize water travel. Um, before the 1820s, if you had produce and you were on the Mississippi River, you loaded it basically on a raft. Um, I mean, it, it was called a flatboat. But it was, it was little more than a raft. You load everything on it, you hop on, and you steer it with long poles. You didn't row it, you let the river take you downstream. Um, steamboats are going to change all of that because steamboats could go against the current. Your flatboat, you might load it up in St. Louis, load it down to New Orleans, when you get to New Orleans, your, the boat itself becomes firewood. It's chopped up and used for something else. I mean, no one's going to drag it back up the river, and that's the only way it's going to get back up river. Uh, but steamboats could go either way. Now, a flatboat would take about six weeks to go from Pittsburgh to New Orleans. It's a long time. And they would carry everything. I mean, everything. Um, but a steamboat could make that trip in 25 days. So not quite half the time, but almost half the time. Um, by 1836, there were over 300 steamboats in use. Um, and steamboats created a market by taking things back up river. Now, all of a sudden, those farmers um, in the Ohio River Valley could buy more stuff because now their goods are coming up the river as well as going down it. Now, flatboats still carried the bulk, you know, the wheat, the corn, the flour, uh, bacon, ham, whiskey, soap, candles, lead, copper, tin, iron, steel. All of these things that they were making were still, it's still cheaper to go by flatboat, but now you have a two way um, means of transferring things and trading posts po points are going to grow up along the river that's what a lot of the towns the towns are going to be now that's great if the rivers go where you want them to what happens when the rivers don't go where you want them to you make new rivers um, I, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Okay, so I didn't mention that Robert Fulton and Robert, Robert Livingston were the first two to start with steamboats. The Claremont was the first one, and it was on the Hudson River in 1807. We talked about that briefly when we talked about that court case. Um, but yeah, when you can't get the river to go where you want it to, you make your own. And that's what the Erie Canal was. And it was the brainchild of Governor DeWitt Clinton of New York. And his idea was to tie the Hudson River to Lake Erie. So you tie it to Lake Erie. That means it's tied to the other Great Lakes. So you can trade with all those other people. If it goes to the Hudson, it's going to New York City. He started this in 1817. Most people thought it was a pipe dream. Couldn't be done. It was too expensive. Uh, there is a great video on Blackboard to watch about how it was being built. And there will be a accompanying extra credit test as soon as I remember to load it up. Um, but he got it done. In 1825, it was complete. 
It was 40 feet wide, four feet deep. It's not a deep river, but barges don't have to be deep. If you looked at those pictures and, and that video that we just watched, those are rather shallow um, hull boats. Um, and it was 363 miles long. So rather long. Uh, it reduced the travel time from New York City to Buffalo from 20 days to six. That's a big reduction. Um, and freight cost went from $100 to five, per, uh, probably a ton per time. Um, the other thing, if you were watching those videos, you noticed, all, I mean, the song's about a mule. There's lots of mules involved. Um, because that's how they move the barges. It's not a naturally flowing river. It's basically a long canal. Uh, it's, it's a canal, okay. It's just basically a long tube of water. It's not really flowing all that well. So <clears throat> what they did was tie a rope to the barge, tie the under, other end of the rope to the mule, and the mule pulls it down the river. And you have a guy that either rides or walks alongside the mule, um, keeping everything moving. It did have a couple of locks, like, you know, the Panama Canal does, but that wasn't as big, as, it wasn't as hard. We weren't, they weren't trying to level out too much. Um, but it's going to change everything. So now, the west, at least the upper west, is tied to the east. Um, things are speeding up. Things are getting cheaper. Um, not only that, other canals are starting to be built. The Delaware and the Hudson Canal uh, link the Pennsylvania coal fields to New York. Uh, by 1837, there's 3,000 miles of waterways. But waterways are not going to be the biggest. <clears throat> That's why I keep looking at my place. I'm maybe looking at the right slide. Um, the biggest change that comes about in this time period. Railroads are. The panic of 1837 kind of cooled canal fever. Canals aren't cheap to build. I mean, there's, you know, if you want a 360 foot long, four foot ditch, somebody's gonna have to grab a shovel or some dynamite or both. Um, Irishmen make, make great workers. Uh, it, it's almost, I, I can say it's almost exclusively dug by Irishmen, but it, probably not entirely. Uh, but by 1837, canal fever had, had kind of cooled off. And there's this new thing out there in 1825, um, this new invention was installed in England called a railroad. Not new to us. We've had railroads around forever. Um, act, you know, railroads are old technology to us. But this was new. And it was sleek, and it was fast, and it was shiny, and it was noisy, um, and it caught on quickly. Uh, Baltimore, Charleston, Boston, all had schemes to uh, build railroads and connect to the interior. Railroads had carrying, you know, they had everything. They had speed. They went a whole 10 miles an hour. Stagecoach could only go four. So you're more than doubling that. Not only that, Railroads could run in the rain and the snow and the heat. And you could put more than a dozen people on one. Or you could put a whole lot of freight on one. And they were reliable. Uh, they had it all. And by 1840, there were over 30,000 miles of railroads in the United States. Fifteen years after it's invented. And it's not even invented in the U.S., so they've got to get it over here first. Um, 
But in less than 15, or about 15 years, 30,000 miles of track. Railroad did a lot, the railroad did a lot of things besides the obvious of moving people and things from one place to another. Uh, they encouraged new settlement and farming as they opened up more areas of the West. Uh, they increased manufacture of iron and other uh, mechanical things that railroads need. Um, so it's spawning new industry. Uh, they also corrupted political life as railroad barons bribed politicians to get what they needed, uh, accelerated the decline of the Indians in the West as um, farming moved out westward for Indians who had been pushed into the great American desert that nobody wants to live on are going to get pushed even further. Um, and it sped up life. Time zones come about because of railroads. Never had time zones before railroads. Railroads run on time. It's very important that Railroad A gets to Station B at a certain time because there's going to be people waiting there that want to get to Station C at a certain time. People start using their watch, start using watches more. People start watching the time. And time zones kind of keep everybody on the same schedule. The last big transportation um, change were clipper ships. Uh, clipper ships are kind of the romantic part of this. They're pretty. They're fast. Um, they're developed about 1845. They double the speeds of the merchant ships. Now, these are the ones like you see in the pirate movies that have all the big, big sails. Um, but they could go really fast. And the important part of going really fast was that they could get products to market quicker, particularly products that had an expiration date. They didn't know what an expiration date was, but we do. Um, I mean, they, they didn't label it in terms of that. But Chinese tea was best soon after it was picked. And Americans and the British had a thing for Chinese tea. Um, so it, it's kind of a very short-lived, very limited market. Uh, but that was one of the things that the clipper ships did. We had opened up trade with China, and these big, gorgeous ships would go and get the tea and bring them in. They also hit just before the California Gold Rush, when people want to get from the East Coast to the West Coast rapidly. Clipper ships were the answer. They sailed faster uh, than any other merchant ship and they could get around the Cape and move people from point A to point B. Um, going cross country was the way most people did it, but it was uh, slow and dangerous. Uh, it is short lived. Within 20 years, steamships will develop to the point that they are ocean bound. Um, they can carry, they can go almost as fast, not quite, clipper ships I think still outdid them on speed but carrying capacity, they had a lot more carrying capacity. Um, so the clipper ships are a short lived kind of blip on that radar, but there's lots and lots of changes going on. You know, in a matter of 20 to 40 years, you're going from walking down the Cumberland Road, to riding on a stage, to taking a railroad. 
And yeah, zero to 10 doesn't sound like a lot, but it is if you have to walk it. Um, especially if you're trying to move items. This is really revolutionary, revolutionizing um, life. Now, most of this has been financed by state and private investors. Uh, the federal government helped some with the turnpikes and canals, but we still have that constitutional uh, problem of how much can the federal government do for infrastructure. Uh, now, the government did provide engineers for railroad surveys, gave lots of land grants um, to the railroads, which helped them um, you know, if you don't have to buy the land, then there's one, one cost you don't have to do, uh, particularly on a line that ran north to south from Chicago to Mobile. They, did, they gave them a lot of land grants on that one. Um, but transportation is not the only big technological. I just do this. Get some. Hmm, let's see what the next slide is because I don't think, I think I skipped some slides. Um, revolution. There's a communications revolution. Um, and there's a scientific revolution. So today I had the choice. It was either the Erie Canal song or another uh, schoolhouse rock about inventions. Um, because this is the time of inventions. Americans really like gadgets. We've liked them from the very beginning. Uh, we talked about that um, with the Enlightenment movement, but um, they really get into it. Joseph Henry does some research on electromagnetism that's going to set some people's worlds on fire. Uh, in 1832, Samuel Morris developed the telegraph. Uh, by 1844, the first inner city telegraph message was sent from Baltimore to Washington. Now, all of a sudden, a message that would have taken days to transport or if you had to give it in person, it would take you days to get there to give it, can go in a matter of seconds. Um, and pretty soon, all of the major uh, cities are connected by telegraph. Before the end of the century, pretty much the entire country is going to be connected by telegraph. San Angelo, which doesn't even exist, has not even been thought of. Um, nobody was thinking about building a town out here in 1832. We'll have the telegraph by 1878. It spreads like wildfire. Um, <clears throat> the Smithsonian is established at this time not so much as a history museum, and Joseph Henry, the guy that did the electromagnetism, is put in charge of it, but more uh, for the spread of knowledge. It's more of a scientific community than just a collection of stuff. Now, they are starting to collect stuff, but um, it's established at the behest of an Englishman, James Smithson, when you get Smithsonian, uh, for the increase and in diffusion of knowledge. Uh, in 1848, the American Association for the Advancement of Science is established to advance science and serve society. And those are, those are the highbrow uh, academic side of this. Now, the telegraph is not. That was a very useful thing. But the theoretical side is at the same time creating very positive
practical things. Um, technology was improving houses. They're making technology, they're changing how steel is put together. Um, you can go higher, you can go bigger. Houses could be larger, better heated, better illuminated. Uh, the affluent could afford indoor plumbing, central heating, gas lighting, bathtubs, ice boxes. Um, you know, now you could actually keep something cold in your own home um, while keeping your home warm without having to chop wood all the time. Uh, even the poor could um, had some changes, coal burning cast iron stoves, as opposed to wood burning cast iron stoves were being developed as opposed to cooking over a hearth. Uh, sewer systems were being laid out in the cities. Not glamorous, but very necessary, very appreciated uh, because prior to sewer systems, what do you think the sewers were? The streets. People just threw that slop out. Um, water lines are being laid. Hydrants are being put in for fighting fires. No more bucket brigades necessarily. Um, it works until your hydrant runs out of water, but it is an improvement. Uh, machine made clothes are hitting the market. You can actually go in a store and buy a dress off a rack. Um, now, machine made is sort of a um, misnomer. Parts of it are machine made. Parts of it are uh, handmade, but they're piecemeal. So if I owned a clothing store and I made shirts, I would have John cut out sleeves. Then I would take that pile of sleeves to Katie and Katie would <clears throat> sew the sleeves together. And then I would take that pile of sleeves um, to Ryan and Ryan would inset them into the dress. Now y'all might do these <clears throat> in a factory or you might do them in your tenement. Um, we'll get to tenements in a, in a little bit. Uh, newspapers and magazines proliferate during this time. Uh, clocks and watches. It's, now people are starting to have to look at time. Uh, time is not a big issue if you're a farmer or if you're living on a farm, subsistence farming. But if you're a wage laborer, and you are supposed to be at work at 7 a.m., time now becomes very important. Um, not only that, if they're paying you by the hour, somebody has to keep track of that. And time is even more important because you want to be credited for when you're there. In 1844, Charles Goodyear um, creates the process to vulcanize rubber, which makes it stand up better. You can use it for tires. Uh, 1846, Elias Howe invents the sewing machine. Singer is going to improve it, and he improves it enough that his name is the one people remember, not Howe's. Um, and all of these, and, and we've talked about all of that. We talked about all the agricultural things, the different plows and the reapers and the um, cotton gin. All of this technology is speeding up life. You know, we live in a world where everything is instantaneous. Um, they did not. They lived in a world where if you needed a message to get to somebody, you needed to expect it was going to take a week or two. And remember the War of 1812. It was technically over before the Battle of New Orleans, but it took so long for the message to get across the ocean we fought it anyway. Um, it's a big, big change. Um, 
And I don't, I don't know how much faster the world can get. And, and yes, I'm old. And I'll admit that I'm old. But I remember when you stood tethered to a telephone and when you dialed, you had to wait. I mean, it sounds stupid now. We didn't think, I never thought anything of it. And actually until I was thinking about this the other day, it takes a long time. If you dial a zero, you pull it around and it goes all the way back because we're used to everything going this fast. You want to know how long something takes? Put 20 seconds on your microwave and stand there. Well, or wait the 30 seconds that you know, you're interrupted in your game because they want to make you watch an ad so you can get an extra play. Um, 30 seconds does, doesn't sound like it should be very long, but it can be very long. But time is, so for them, it would probably be like, our 30 seconds would be like an hour. Things are going very, very fast for, for a lot of people. And we're going to have an industrial revolution at this during, as part of all of this change. Um, now the industrial revolution has been going on in England since the early 1700s. Um, and England, I'm not quite sure how, but they managed to keep the invention of the steam engine under wraps. They had steam run factories in the early 1700s before our revolution. Uh, but no one who knew how to build an engine was allowed to leave England. Plans were not allowed to be taken out of England. It's improved on in 1875 by James Watts. It's getting, you know, major improvement. And in 18 or 1780, 89, I think I said, it's, so it's 1765, a man named Samuel Slater left England with the plans for a water-powered spinning mill in his head. Uh, he convinced some people to join him. They bought some land in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Um, that should be 1790, not 1890, and built them a steam engine. And it was successful because it worked. And he had 15 children in there making yarn that was passable. It, it was workable yarn. Uh, and then came Jefferson's embargo. Now we can't buy yarn because we're not buying anything from London, from England, um, which made it even better, spurred it on. And by 1850, there's hundreds of mills, but they're going to go through some changes. You know, mills are fine, um, but mills need people. And we are rapidly changing from a rural society to an urban industrialized society. Um, and that means taking people out of their normal setting and putting them somewhere else. Now, women were preferred workers in the, in the textile factories. Uh, one, they were smaller generally than men. Uh, and everybody was smaller than we are now, but generally they were smaller so you could they could maneuver around the machines better. Their hands were littler, they could get into the littler cracks, and they were willing to take less money than men for payment. Um, so the Boston Manufacturing Company uh, set up shop on the Merrimack River in a little village that they renamed Lowell in, 19, in 1822. Um, Francis Cabot Lowell was the head of the Boston Associates. <clears throat> and they built a factory to take raw material to finish cloth. 
They weren't making the clothes. They were just making the fabric. Uh, and he hires primarily young women. Um, and initially, he has a very paternalistic kind of philanthropic, I'm not going to get that word right, um, idea for his system. He builds what will later become a company, the concept will become a company town. So you have the Lowell factory, or the, the manufacturing factory, and he builds houses and dormitories for the girls. And he hires them off farms. And at first they are kind of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, not a lot of immigrants, a lot of natural or American born girls, usually between like 15 and 18, 15 and 20. They worked on a very strict schedule, but they were to appease their parents. Well, one, they're getting paid. Uh, they were given schooling, three meals a day, a roof over their head. Um, they had church services that they had to attend to. They had a house mother that took care of them. Um, and it works for a while the way he envisioned it, you know, where you had happy little girls working at the factory. Um, but by the 1840s, there's 32 mills and 50 or 32 mills and factories right there in the Merrimack River area along the Merrimack River. Um, and the workforce had shifted from American born to immigrants, primarily the Irish. Um, and a little less care is given to their upbringing. Um, it's a polite way of putting it. And you also have some changes in um, ownership, different owners of different factories, you know, had different outlooks and people start looking more at the bottom line than at employee uh, health, safety and welfare. Uh, there was another system that they used, which was the Rhode Island system, which hired entire families, uh, left the father in charge. Um, but you would have an entire family working. Now they didn't do the same jobs, you know, um, children. There were there were divisions. You know, the men did the heavier stuff, like bringing in the heavy raw material, carrying out the heavy bolts of fabric. Um, the women ran the weaving machines. Children did all kinds of things. Uh, they ran weaving machines too. And there's another series of videos and an extra credit test on the Lowell system that's on Blackboard. I'll try to put the test up today. But it's, it's kind of changing the focus of how people live. You're not staying at home with daddy until you marry anymore. You're going out into the world. Um, and whether it's a factory along the Merrimack River or a factory in New York or Boston or any of these other places, you're not home particularly helping the family. You're not learning those domestic duties. So it's, and, and, and women and children are starting to work, which is very different from the revolutionary period where women and children stayed home. Uh, men worked, but even then men were mostly farmers. Now men are, were, are artisans. Now men are working in factories as well. And all of this industrialization has another side. It's going to screw up the environment. Between 1820 and 1850, 
Forty textile and flour mills are built on the Merrimack River. The Merrimack River is not that long. And each factory is going to divert water in order to make their mill run at the prime level. Because most of them are run, you know, the big wheels, the big water wheels, that's what's running these. Um, and they are powered by various means. If you have enough natural river flow, that can, that can suffice. If you don't, what you do is you dam the river up and then channel it so that it's just coming out where you need it. Well, if you dam the river up, that's going to affect people both upstream and downstream from you, even if you're letting the water out in a certain amount. Now, multiply that times 40. You've got 40 different people messing with the flow of the river. And you have farmers who need that water to water their crops. Now, common law has always stated that uh, the river belonged pretty much to everybody, but if you had land along the river, you could use it for irrigation purposes. Um, you work to divert the flow of the river entirely. This is going to change that. Uh, this is going to challenge common law. And factory owners did this by, one, buying land along the river, which made them, you know, owners along the river with rights to the water. Um, but they're diverting it more than normal. Um, they would buy off the farmers that lived around them uh, and get their acquiescence that way. But even now, uh, there were issues that came up. Uh, in 1859, angry farmers, loggers, and fishermen uh, tried unsuccessfully to destroy a dam that was on the Merrimack River because, you know, we just talked about farmers. Loggers need the river because that's how they get their logs from point A to point B. You drop you know, chop down the tree, you roll it into the river, let it float down, and somebody picks it up downstream. Well, if there's a dam in the way, it's not going downstream. And if you're a factory owner, you certainly don't want a log coming through that little opening that you've made to, I mean, that's going to mess up your water wheel. Um, and the fishermen, it's going to, it messes up the whole flow of the river and the fish habitats. Um, so it's going to change the environment. Not only that, there's pollutants involved, um, and we're not going to get a hold on that until like the 1970s, 80s. Um, when you, if the, then the second half we talk, second half of this class, 1302, we get to talk about how nasty the Green River was um, back in the 70s, 1970s. And the cities are changing. We've already talked about some of the technology. Um, in 1790, 3% of the population lived in cities, urban centers. By 1860, 16%. And yes, that still means we're a predominantly rural uh, country, but it's changing. And, and that's a pretty big change. And these cities are going to have an influence far beyond that 16% of the population. New York, Philadelphia, Boston, uh, New Orleans were the biggest cities. New York was the fastest and biggest. Uh, and when you add the Erie Canal, it's going to grow uh, exponentially. Certain cities became known for certain things. Uh, Pittsburgh is the iron center. Cincinnati is the meat center. Um, Louisville, which is at the head of the Ohio River Falls, becomes a trade center. Uh, Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee, they all become trade centers on the Great Lakes. Uh, St. Louis is 
uh, the fur trade, and it's also going to be the stepping off point for a lot of people who are heading west. Um, and these cities are going to have an influence beyond what uh, you would think for having 16% of the population. Uh, and part of this is in popular culture. Now, during the colonial pe period, rural, commun communal, rural life revolved around, at least as far as entertainment, communal activities. Communal activities were where you, you got together with people. That's when you had fun. Um, farming can be fun, but not on a daily basis. But barn raisings, corn huskings, shooting matches, foot races, parties, those things were fun. And they were usually done as communal organizations. Now, families would do things in their own home, but if you're living on a farm, usually it's work is from sunup to sundown, and then you go to bed. You know, you look forward to these communal activities. Um, coastal areas had sailing and fishing. Cities, colonial cities, um, parlor games, balls, sleigh rides, picnics, those were the types of entertainment you had. Entertainment is now kind of changing. Uh, you still have all of these things. Barn raisings are still a thing that is going to happen, particularly as people move west and open up new areas and build communities. But in these urban centers, you have some new things going on. Uh, one of the big is social drinking. By 1829, or in 1829, the Secretary of War estimated that three-fourths of the nation's laborers were drinking four ounces of hard liquor daily. You know, that's a half a cup of whiskey. Doesn't sound like a lot, but you know a shot is an ounce. So four shots um, daily. And that's the average. So you got people that are higher and people that are lower. And that's not including beer which was kind of like the daily con consumption. Um, and drinking spanned all religions, all races, and all classes. Taverns are still the big social spot. They are during the colonial period. They get even <clears throat> bigger in this time period. Um, taverns were where you went to find out who had jobs open where you went to have your beer after work. Or if you were a woman, you would take your growler and go to the back door and have a fillet, and then you took it home for your husband and you. Because um, women just didn't hang out in the taverns. This wasn't, wasn't accepted. Um, you also have social clubs forming, particularly business-oriented social clubs, like all of the carpenters and all of the shoemakers and you have sporting clubs uh blood sports are becoming very big dog fighting cock fighting um but they kind of yeah, they, they get big and then they fade out the biggest is prize fighting boxing boxing becomes very very popular in the uh, cities in early America, in this time, you know, this early 1800s era. Um, they tended, the boxers tended to be immigrants, either Irish or German. They were usually sponsored by like a fire company or a street gang or a fraternal organization. Um, they, these were barehanded fights. They were brutal. Um, one fight in 1842 went 119 rounds before one of the fighters died and ended it. Uh, a lot of cities outlawed the practice because it was fairly brutal, but that didn't stop people. There was a lot of betting that went on. Uh, there was a lot of 
territorial pride. You know, if your guy won, um, which meant you go to the tavern and get drunk. Um, but prize fighting becomes very big. It's not the only entertainment. Um, running out of time. Theaters become very popular. Opera houses, music halls, playhouses, uh, Shakespeare's tragedies, melodramas. I mean, pretty much anything was open. Melodramas, comedies, uh, operas, acrobatics, acrobatics. They had or orders, people who just talked. Um, was a form of entertainment. You would go and listen to somebody speak, and they had some very good speakers. The newest and very American entertainment that comes out of this time period are the minstrel shows. Uh, the minstrel shows were a very particular type of show. They were kind of a variety show, kind of like a melodrama in a sense, but they were done in blackface. Uh, you had white actors with black makeup pretending to be black people, and they normally made fun of them in the stereotypical way. They also made fun of Germans and Irish in the same minstrel shows. Um, you know, racism was part of the entertainment. It's just, it was a racist time. The audiences were primarily young and middle-aged men. Theaters, even if you were doing a Shakespearean tragedy, were not respectable places for women because these crowds got into it. If they liked what you were doing, they cheered. If they hated what you were doing, they booed and threw things like rocks, tomatoes, chairs, whatever was handy. Um, it could be very raucous in there. Um, those blackface minstrel shows were immensely popular with the northern working classes and the southern whites. Uh, this is when Stephen F. Foster, if any of you are music majors, you've probably heard of him. If you're not, you probably should know that there's a guy named Stephen F. Foster who created a sound for this time period that was very American. He's the one that wrote Oh Susanna and My Old Kentucky Home. Um, this is that. This is his time period. And we're going to stop there. We'll talk about immigration when we come back because I'm running out of air. <laughs> On the trick or treating, it was like a three day extravaganza at Halloween. Because <laughs> of <laughs> being on a Sunday, we did the fall festival Friday, Saturday was trick or treats, and then yesterday we went trick or treating on my birthday. I was like, it's my favorite holiday, but I was so bad. I was like, okay, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I signed up for your history to be your. It just says not as happened. It's the eight day cookies. I figure that's it. Yeah, I've got the same one that does eight day cookies. Oh, oh, or oh, I was going to tell you, you were talking about the industrial revolution and plumbing. And so, um, their very first slogan when they actually started the Plumbers Union in New York was protecting the health of the nation. Yeah, oh, well, it was. I actually have a, a really old poster. And it's got a plumber standing, and there's a crowd, and the New York City skyline in the back. <laughs> cool. 